From the moment it was conceived until its inauguration, the viaduct of Millau caught the imagination of the world. A colossus, 2,460 meters long, supported by the tallest piers ever erected, weighing around 290,000 tons, constructed in a mere three years to the day. The Millau Viaduct is a monument to high precision work and the will to take on awe-inspiring challenges. In the region of Occitania, in the south of France, lies the city of Millau. At the end of the last century, Millau is well known throughout the country, yet for the wrong reasons. Each year in summer, there are kilometers of traffic jams. It's nothing new for drivers passing through Millau. The A75 connects northern Europe to the Mediterranean. Before the completion of the viaduct, it was necessary to leave the highway, manage the narrow streets of the small town of Millau, and then regain the expressway. It was infernal. Even we locals were tricked by the maze of small rural roads, but for people who had just begun their first days of vacation, imagine what it was like to be stuck in a traffic jam for five hours. Record bottlenecks each year, a region unable to develop its economy. In the 1990s, the powers that be decide to build a viaduct that would link the Tarn Valley with the overland traffic. It will be designed by the British architect, Lord Norman Foster. The task of steering the project in the field is assigned to Michel Villelogeur, one of the foremost specialists in the world of bridges and viaducts. Among his prior achievements are the Normandy Bridge, and more recently, the Yavuz Sultan Selim Bridge in Istanbul. The challenge he faces is daunting, as the length and height of the bridge promise to be gigantic. The scope of the work is considerable, to say the least, and the feasibility studies are themselves a huge task. A project like this requires an enormous amount of time. Between the search for the actual route and the cutting of the ribbon, exactly 17 years went by. Thus, in October 2001, work on the foundations begins. Yet each of the seven pylons which will support the highway section requires a substructure. It will serve as a base for the foundations, since the ground is far from being flat. The valley is steep, so to root the foundations, a substructure is mandatory, with dimensions already impressive. Moroccan wells are dug, vertical tubes reaching several meters deep, which will provide a hold within the hard rock. They're like well shafts below the concrete footing. They're five meters in diameter and up to 18 meters deep, like the feet of an elephant. They're not straight, but slightly inclined. The length of the individual tubes depends on the depth of which the rock is hard. Five or 18 meters may seem a lot, but as a support to a pylon that is 245 meters high, they're very small roots for a very big tree. Once hard rock is reached, each tube is filled with concrete. Thus, the combined weight of the pylons and the actual roadway rests on an extremely stable base. But there's another highlight, the optical effect. It was Norman Foster's idea that the pylons should emerge from the natural terrain. Once the foundations are finished, the pylons will be erected. There'll be seven in all, built simultaneously, each spaced 342 meters apart, with a very particular technique. The pylons are poured with concrete on site, directly above the foundations, in successive slices four meters high, with a mobile framework which acts as a mold. When a slice of four meters is dry, the framework will go up using rails inside the shafts, and the workers will be able to pour a further four meters of concrete, allowing for extremely fast progress. 
Every three days we had another four meters belt. It was pretty impressive to come every day and see how it moved steadily upwards. The pylons are rising higher and higher, but not all are the same size. P1 and P7 at the ends are the smallest, at 94 and 77 meters respectively. P4, P5 and P6 reach up to between 100 and 150 meters, but it's P2 and P3 that impress the most. P2 is a colossus in itself. And like the other six, it's split or doubled in its upper part. All pylons are made this way, including the smallest P7. The split sets in at 90 meters. One of the reasons is overall aesthetics. It lends grace to the pylons. It gives them a finesse, which is quite important and impressive. Yet splitting them was also a necessity. Since the viaduct of Millor moves, deforms, lengthens, shrinks, contorts. All this is vital for the durability of the work and is due to several factors. The first is a formidable enemy. It's the notorious wind of the region. The wind in Millau is particularly aggressive. Wind has a major impact on stretched out bridges, especially given the shape of this valley, the deepest part of the French plateau. The wind is completely transformed during the passage of the valley and can vigorously shake the pylons. In the valley, the wind can exceed 100 kilometers per hour. To reduce the influence of the wind on the pylons, the team of Michel Villeleu split their upper parts so that the wind will pass through, thus lessening its impact. The deck rests on the pylons, but it's not merely laid down, it's also hooked. There are cable systems to keep it from being raised when there is wind. Thus, a pylon may oscillate up to 60 centimeters in a violent wind. This relative flexibility, due to the number of supports, avoids over-constraint to the single pylon, enabling it to resist the force of the wind. 60 centimetres is a lot for traffic, so we close the bridge when there are winds of this magnitude. It will take a year and a half before all the seven pylons have reached the same level. Yet it's only then that the most critical phase begins, moving the road section on top of each of the seven piles. To achieve this, the engineers adopt a technology as spectacular as it is effective. The road deck will arrive in parts. On either side of the valley, the workers are continually receiving parts of the deck ready to be assembled. The parts are made from sheet metal. Of course, it's necessary to cut these sheets. However, this is never done on site, but in factories with the proper machinery. The strategy put in place is to assemble the deck on each side of the valley, then to push forward the parts from both sides until they join together. Yet to get there, you have to overcome a major problem. The distance between the pylons is 342 meters. As it's far too risky to push thousands of tons into the empty space over such a distance, temporary towers are erected to reduce the crossing of the void. They will allow the road deck to have a support every 171 meters. These gigantic structures made of metal and up to 200 meters high will only stand during the actual construction of the bridge. Yet what looks like mere scaffolding will help secure the moving of the deck. A feat that will be possible thanks to a unique device, the translator. We had to develop a prototype. The translators are placed within the concrete abutments on both ends of the bridge, which support the steel span. 
A translator is a hoist, which allows the deck to be advanced over the void to the next pylon or steel tower, based on a simple principle. The translator operates by two wedges under the deck. It raises it, moves it forward, then rests it, before raising it again, moving it further forward. The operation is repeated almost 300 times until the deck reaches its next support. You lift, you push, you lower, you go back, you lift again. It's a 60 centimeter shot each time. The deck advances as the translator moves forth and back until, after 171 meters, it reaches the next pylon or the next tower. It's an extremely tricky operation with the deck advancing over the void of more than 200 meters above the ground. Everyone was worried, is it going to break? But it was pretty impressive to see this huge mass of metal moving like, well, a piece of spaghetti over these heights. Whenever the deck settles on the top of a pylon or tower, additional translators are brought forward. As the road deck progresses, it becomes ever longer and heavier and requires more and more power to lift it. Dozens of computers are working as a network to operate the translators. Synchronization must be to a thousandth of a second to lift the span at the same time at its points of support, as well as advance it by the same momentum. There are up to 64 translators for moving the 36,000 tons of the deck. It was paramount that all the translators worked at the same time and that the pylons or the steel towers didn't oscillate too much during the movement. To verify that, there were lasers fixed on the ground pointing to the top of the towers and pylons to make sure that we ended up within the defined target. Thrusting a span over 171 meters to the next support takes three days. It's a formidable challenge, since this phase of construction with thousands of tons suspended over a void does not brook any interruption. To initiate a push, we needed wind conditions of less than 72 kilometers per hour for three days. So the Met people had to be able to forecast three or four days during which there would not be a wind stronger than that. To save time, the teams will be working from both ends of the bridge, starting with the southern span. Its northern counterpart will be launched several months later. The precision was exceptional, since we had a deviation of less than 10 millimeters, both in the lateral and in the vertical. A feat even more impressive, because the two road decks were prepared at different times of the year, in different factories, and by different teams of engineers and workers. There was indeed fear that the parts wouldn't fit. But on May 28, 2004, at 1412, the decks are joined. It's the culmination of 15 months of thrust. I must tell you that when the two banks of the Tarn Valley finally met, my throat was tight, like I was strangled. If you look at the deck at the time of its junction, you will see that the structure is actually undulated iron. Once the deck is linked into a single unit, five masts will be positioned, each on top of a pylon, and each the size of a 29-story building weighing 700 tons. The masts are first transported in parts lying down by four trailers each, then joined, grabbed by immense arms of steel and tilted upwards on top of the pylons. Putting the masts in place takes three months. To an engineer like Michel Villelogieux, it's nothing new. The basic procedure proved itself thousands of years ago. It's like with the obelisks. An obelisk was finished on the ground, then the Egyptians raised it by a combination of cable systems and holes. The masts of the Mio viaduct have been raised in exactly the same way. 
Then the masts are connected to the deck by stays on each side, so that the weight of the deck between two piers will rest on the vertical axis of each pier. The deck is held by cables, which act as stays on the pylon. On each side of a mast, there are 11 stays attached to the deck, making for a total of 154 stays. Inside, they are filled with steel cables. Thus, each stay supports an average of 240 tons of the deck, which weighs a total of 36,000 tons. The stays have a lifespan of about 40 years before they'll have to be replaced. The future highway has finally breached the 2,460 meters of the Tarn Valley. Like the piers, the whole bridge has been designed to withstand the force of the wind. The aerodynamics of the deck are that of an inverted airplane wing. Thus, gusts exceeding 150 kilometers per hour will not lift the deck, but press it onto its supports. My people worked 80,000 hours in total on the steel structure. That's the equivalent of 55 years for a single person. And of those 80,000 hours, at least 85% were spent solely on construction. The viaduct can withstand gales of up to 205 kilometers per hour. But there's another impacting phenomenon, dilation. People have trouble imagining that the viaduct is actually moving. It will stretch with the summer heat, especially the metal deck. In winter, on the other hand, it shrinks, it retracts. The deck is not made of concrete like the piers, but of steel, a material that has a huge advantage. It's lighter than a concrete deck, which, because of its weight, would have needed twice as many stays, and thus would have resulted in a less airy appearance. Yet steel has a particularity. Its structure deforms with the changes in temperature. At the Millor viaduct, the amplitude between winter and summer can reach up to 1.8 meters. To smooth the impact, two joints are positioned on both ends of the bridge. They provide the junction between the concrete abutment that does not move and the steel deck that does. But here, we're talking about joints of two meters each. Under the joints, there's a ruler that allows the deformations of the deck in one direction or the other to be read by the naked eye. Back then, during the first days of the summer heat, we watched it almost minute by minute, because we didn't really know if we were within the marks or not. The sensitive zones of the joints require numerous safety tests. It had to be ensured that they wouldn't collapse under the repeated passage of heavy goods vehicles. 30 trucks are moving onto the viaduct, weighing 26 tons each, a total of almost 900 tons. The trucks are parked in the middle of the bridge for an hour between two piers, a situation that never occurs during circulation, but it provides an excellent test. The engineers check the inclination that could result from the additional weight. But there's nothing to worry about. Inside the road deck, they're preparing to fight an enemy that could wreak havoc if they let it. Rust. Rust is poison to steelworks, especially if one is over 2,500 meters long. And in view of such dimensions, putting on a layer of anti-rust is hardly feasible. Given its surface area, painting would have taken a very long time and cost a lot of money. So we installed the dehumidification system that keeps the humidity level inside the deck at less than 45%. In all, nine units are thus put in place, one under each mast and two at both ends of the viaduct. Now the coating of the deck can start. 10,000 tons of bitumen are spread in a mere four days. Then the signal system is installed. And with that, after three years of work, the viaduct of Millor is finished. The result is astounding. 
The calculations of the planners have been turned into reality. Everyone is impressed. The effect of the real scale cannot be pre-planned on paper. It's really quite spectacular. And to increase the pleasure of crossing the Tarn Valley on this new stretch of motorway, the designers worked on an additional visual effect. If the viaduct was straight, a driver coming onto it would see just the one mast in front of him. If I build in a slight curve, this allows the piers to be seen one after another. And in the distance, you see the end of the viaduct while you're still at the first pier. This curve of the viaduct is unique, beautiful.